Hey everybody, this is Dr. Maples. Welcome back to our Social Change in Appalachia series. So today we're gonna to talk about coal extraction in Central Appalachia. You know, you can't really think about Central Appalachia's history without at some point coming across coal. It's such an important part of the region's political economy. And to really appreciate Central Appalachia and to also understand the mine wars in West Virginia, which we're gonna talk about in a few weeks, we really need to have a basic understanding of coal's history in the region. So we're gonna do two things today. First First off, we're going to spend some time learning about why coal was so important around the turn of the century. And we're also going to learn why Appalachia, of all places, ends up being chosen as where all sorts of coal is going to come out of the ground for the United States. Now, in later lecture series, as we build up to talking about the mine wars in West Virginia, we are going to spend time trying to understand how coal camps are designed so that they're the centerpiece of the mining activities and also how coal camps are designed to basically operate without being interrupted. In fact, those interruptions end up being the cause of the West Virginia mine wars. If you haven't already subscribed to the channel, please do so. Likewise, I always appreciate comments and such below. Feel free to like the video as well. We got a lot to do today, so uh, let's get started. So to understand why coal matters, let's actually go back in time, if you don't mind. Let's go back to 1870 for a minute. What's happening in the United States in 1870, right? We're just right after the Civil War. It's just been over for five years. On top of that, we're into Reconstruction, where we're rebuilding all the damage that the war had caused, particularly in a lot of southern areas, and that includes places like Pittsburgh and Knoxville in the United States, both of which are in Appalachia. But what else did that mean? Well, that particular time in American history meant that we were right in the heart of an American industrial revolution. Now, an industrial revolution does a couple of things. It changes how we produce goods, but it also changes how the labor market functions. Imagine a world in the United States where people worked on small farms or in small communities, and you established relationships with the people who created the stuff that you needed to survive. You fit into their lives by offering something that they needed, you did service, maybe you hunted or you created something at the blacksmith, and then you could trade that for the things that you need. Money still existed, but that was a big medium is that you had this close relationship with the people that made the stuff that you needed to survive. As we move away from that with the American Industrial Revolution, we now see people relocating from rural areas and moving into urban cities. These cities would have all the industrial centers, the uh, mills and so forth where we could create stuff. And now people would take on these wage labor jobs where they would work a full day, and then they would take that money and buy the stuff that they needed to survive. The bartering system, the close knowledge of the people who made the stuff you need, that went away with time. Now you were basically trying to buy from total strangers, but money was the relationship. It was the currency of that situation. This is, by the way, for those of you thinking in theoretical terms, uh, Tony's work on Gemeinschaft and Gesellschaft. Gemeinschaft having those close-knit ties, Gesellschaft moving away from those close-knit ties into an urban area where now we're building these new relationships with total strangers using money as a form of trade. This was really big because it changes how the United States is operating and how it thinks about jobs on a regular basis. Now, we're going to come to find out industrial revolutions thrive on really two things, energy and people. And energy is going to be a hard one for the United States. You know, timber is something that could work, but the problem with timber is that temperatures used in the whole process of creating energy and running machines it's just not predictable and stable. You're constantly having to restoke wood furnaces to keep temperatures steady. They fluctuate a lot. And that's no good. We want a nice, steady temperature. There is, however, something that can fix that situation, and that's coal. Coal can burn at a very clear, predictable temperature, depending on the kind of coal that you're dealing with. And it can make sure this industrial revolution keeps chugging forward. It may surprise you, but coal didn't really have all that much of a value before the American Industrial Revolution. It was useful in some situations. Blacksmiths were using it to create tools. Coal could be used in the creation of salt. It was also used in iron furnaces in eastern Kentucky's Red River Gorge. But by and far, it didn't really have a big value. It wasn't something that we really quite understood how to use just yet. It was also something, too, that you generally would get locally. It's not something that you're going to have to import. Um, because it was also pretty readily available. It was just kind of all over the ground, right? And also not too far under the ground. So we knew coal could be useful in starting a fire, but we didn't really understand what we could do with it. 
We did know from a pretty early day, however, that coal was all over Appalachia, and we'll talk about why those conditions mattered in a moment. Benjamin Franklin mentions in his papers that, you know, there's coal in this area that would be West Virginia eventually. Uh, George Washington, interestingly enough, is also involved in surveying West Virginia's New River Gorge, uh, this area that ends up being in a very important coal extraction area. And I faintly recall a quote from him talking about how the coal was just lying around everywhere so you could just pick it up. But again, we didn't really know quite what we wanted to do with it. Now in this situation, all this coal in Appalachia, totally inaccessible. You're not going to try to export that stuff and send it down the river. It's just not functional to do that. And there also was not a demand there until we figured out that we really needed coal as part of the in energy production process. Once that clicked, now all of a sudden, Appalachia has a really valuable resource. But we still can't get to it, right? Well, let's jump forward with the railroads. The railroads are now expanding into all sorts of new areas and places like Chicago, Illinois can be linked to all sorts of other places where we can now send supplies as export from one where area to Chicago for production purposes. In fact, we can export coal from one place, say, you know, West Virginia, and then send it to Chicago and they might send it even further. They might even send it abroad. But this resource now has a value. So we're now in a situation where everyone says, well, hey, there's all this coal in Appalachia, let's get it. And it creates two interesting scenarios. The first one is what we call prospectors. These are people who basically will come through an area, and if it has some kind of resource value, they'll try to purchase the land cheap and before the big rush of extraction starts happening in around the area. Basically, the idea is that you come in, you buy the land for cheap, and then you sell it to someone else who knows what they want to do with it and extracting the resource. You sell it to them for a lot of money. Prospectors Prospectors were interesting. They came through often as surveyors like George Washington. They knew what they saw. They would purchase the land, and then they would often turn this over to what we call absentee landowners. Now, absentee landowners are people who don't actually live in the areas where they own ha uh, houses, property, and so forth. In fact, we even see that with like Verbos and Airbnbs today, but that's a whole other lecture series. With this situation, people would buy entire mountains and never actually even see the property, but they would use it and lease it to people who would come in and extract coal. And this was great in the sense that it created this very big economic impact. You know, all of a sudden these railroads were moving into small haulers so that we could extract coal out of the ground, load it into trains, and get it to places again like Chicago and also urban centers like Lexington for closer to central Appalachia. This creates a situation, however, though, where the people who own the property aren't necessarily part of the community and ends up creating lots of issues about not even being concerned about the well-being of the people there. Nonetheless, this whole situation, along with the American Industrial Revolution, sets up a firestorm for economic growth and development in Appalachia, and particularly central Appalachia, who happen to be rich with this sickly black rock that catches on fire in the right conditions. I am strangely proud of the fact that the Appalachian mountain range is one of the oldest mountain ranges on the planet. It's really, really old. In fact, that's why it's been weathered down so much. You know, whereas we struggle to get above 5,000 feet in the Appalachian mountain range, you can go out to any of the ranges to the west of here and they're like, you know, 10,000 footers. It also was really exciting because it created the conditions that were pretty ideal for creating a particular kind of coal. So this billion year process of having this mountain range was part and parcel with making a kind of coal we call bituminous coal. Now, bituminous coal is a soft coal. That means that you have it in your hand, it's kind of crumbly, it's even oily to some degree. That's part of that uh, bitumen, if I remember correctly, that's in the coal. But it's part of that ignition process, right? Coal burns. And in this particular case, bituminous coal was actually pretty attractive for a couple of reasons. It wasn't as high grade as something like anthracite, which was great for heat production, but was also very costly and required sorting. Instead, it was this soft, crumbly coal that you get it out of the ground, you clean the clay, dirt, and so forth off of it, you throw it on a train, you send it to where it's going to go straight into a furnace. There's no sorting mechanism that really need to be done, no hard work. You just get it in the carts, 
you get it to the furnace and you're done. One of the other things about it too is that it was pretty low in sulfur, which was a problem. Um, you didn't want a lot of sulfur in your coal. Um, and on top of that too, it was very high in carbon, which meant that it burned really well and it gave a lot of great heat. In fact, it burned very predictably, which was also a really desirable thing. Um, it was also pretty easy to access it. Shaft mines, uh, open pit mines, surface mines, you generally could find coal without much issue. The shaft mines were interesting though because this particular kind of uh, coal was really bad for producing something called damp. You've heard the idea of the canary in the coal mine. Well, this is one example of damp. Damp is a gas that basically does not include enough oxygen for the human brain to function. And so people who get into damp would simply fall over dead, not realizing that they weren't breathing oxygen. This damp would kill the canaries before it would kill the miners. So if the canary fell over dead with its small little lungs, you knew that there was a problem and that you needed to get out of the mines. So with the shaft mines, we were seeing a lot more damp in the mines, which made them much dangerous, much more dangerous. It was very cheap energy, however. Again, there wasn't a lot of work that was required to this. You just get it out, you get it on the train, get it into the furnace. So that was really attractive that this soft, crumbly coal was available. And since Appalachia happened to have a lot of it, that made it even more attractive for this American Industrial Revolution. So we've got the energy source. We can fuel this Industrial Revolution and will, in fact, going through World War I and even arguably into World War II, all because Appalachia has this amazing coal. How are we going to power this coal mining process, however? That's going to be the problem. In fact, believe it or not, we really had to see the mines take a moment to figure out how they were going to get the people of Appalachia into the mines to work. Fun fact, they actually went outside of Appalachia to do part of that. When we think about the face of coal mining in the United States, I regret to say that it's often an image of a thin West Virginia white male. And truth be told, that's such a flawed historical take on who the coal miners of Appalachia were, particularly around 1870. So at this particular moment, mines are basically having to import workers in many situations. Remember, 1870, we're five years removed from the Civil War, and one of the big tenets of the Civil War was ending slavery in the United States. Well, now that slavery is over, we have an entire community of people who are often looking for work and facing discrimination and trying to find jobs. What do coal mines do? Well, they take advantage of this situation and import workers from the South. They go into black communities and they don't offer jobs necessarily. They actually offer train rides. They tell people, hey, we will give you a train ride. It's going to be great. We'll give you lunch. We're going to take you up through Appalachia. And also, if you want work, there's so much work up here. You won't have any trouble finding a job. They didn't necessarily say what kind of job and that it was going to be a dangerous, scary underground job on top of that. But it worked. Lots of people would hop on for the train ride because that was free. And they basically would find themselves in rural West Virginia with no hope of getting out of there. And they end up working in the coal mines. In fact, we'll talk a little bit more about that compulsion to work in our next lecture series. On top of that, too, we saw that these mines needed some technological advances, particularly the work of stonemasons to make sure that they could create safe areas in the mines to ensure that the roofs didn't collapse, that miners could be in there and get the coal out as effectively and as much of the coal as they could while they were doing it. So for this, we actually see that mines were going to port cities and pulling in immigrants who had experience as stonemasons, particularly from Italy when we look at the history of West Virginia. What, what happened is they would recruit people in as stonemasons, but also as coal miners, and again, put them on trains, bring them into Appalachia. Miners who were white and were in Appalachia certainly were part of this history. But in this situation, we had the people who were already living here who were not just white, they were very diverse, they were immigrants, remember, um, but they also were basically farmers. They were agrarian lifestyle folks who were sort of eking out a living in these small little haulers. They were turning away from this to enter the mines because, well, the mines could offer some great wages. You know, at first it was maybe working a few extra shifts there or some seasonal labor in the winter when there wasn't any farming to be done, going and working in the mines to make a little money. But with time, working in the mines was so profitable compared to this farming existence that people would just let their farms go and go to work in the mines full time. In other cases, too, people would even start small family mines to try and extract their own coal. but 
that's sort of a whole subsection of history that we won't have time to explore. Nonetheless, we see people who already lived in Appalachia basically putting down their plows, putting away their horses, and picking up a pickaxe and shovel to simply go work in the mine as the American Industrial Revolution changes how we thought about our survival and what we needed to do to get our daily bread. So there we have it. American Industrial Revolution comes in and changes how we think about our historical materialism, our survival, and how it relates to the production of goods. Moreover, we see people starting to move away from rural areas and into cities to take advantage of working at mills. But for coal mining, we actually see the opposite. People are now being brought in by train, sometimes under very icky, uh, dubious circumstances, to work in the coal mines. Moreover, that coal is going to be critical because without it, the American Industrial Revolution, I would argue, doesn't happen. So if you like the goods and services that are being produced today in the United States, thank Appalachia because we paid the cost for it. Oh, I'm getting ahead of myself. We've got a lot to talk about in the future. In our next lecture series, we're going to start exploring how coal camps are developed, how they're created so that mining is the central activity. And we're also going to talk about how that is not an accident. After that, we're going to start turning our attention to the West Virginia Mine Wars. Thanks for being a part of this channel. Thanks for watching. If you haven't subscribed, please do so. Feel free to like the video, leave comments below, and most importantly, I'll see you next time. Take care.